Hello and welcome everyone. The time has now passed 5 p.m., which is the stated commencement time for the 2020 Annual General Meeting. I will now call the meeting to order. For the purposes of this meeting, the minutes will be taken by Chris Defteros as the nominated company secretary. On behalf of the board, I would like to welcome you to the 2020 Annual General Meeting of the Safety Institute of Australia Limited trading as the Australian Institute of Health and Safety. This meeting is being webcast and those members logged onto the webcast can ask questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will ask those questions to those presenting at the time via, the, via our Zoom functions. The Zoom meeting link for the webcast was emailed to all members with a reminder that was sent out this morning. Should you wish to ask a question at any time during the proceeding, please use the Q&A box in the Zoom. We are uh, reserving the raise your hand function only for voting in this meeting. Before proceeding any further, I would like to acknowledge that we are coming together on the custodial lands of the oldest living civilization in the world. Today, I'm speaking to you from Brisbane, Queensland, and this is a contested space. So I pay my respects to both the Yuggera people and the Turrbal people and their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the hopes, dreams and traditions and cultures of Aboriginal Australia. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work and join us here today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who also are joining us in the meeting. And now move on to agenda item two, apologies. Apologies for the meeting have been received and noticed and I now call upon the company secretary to advise of any apologies. Hi Naomi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I haven't received any apologies for this meeting. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. So now move on to agenda item three, declarations of proxies. I now call for declaration of proxies and I invite Chris back again, our company secretary, to declare any proxies received. Hi Naomi, it's me again. There are no uh, proxies that have been uh, received. Thank you. You can stay with me, Chris, because you're okay. on the agenda item as well. <laughs> So agenda item four is the declaration of a quorum. The meeting is not able to commence without a quorum, which under our company constitution is 20 members present, either in person, which we cannot do, uh, or via proxy, sorry, we can do in person, but online. Uh, so Chris, do we have a quorum? Yes, we do, uh, Naomi. So at last count uh, was 61 members present. Um, so congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I will now move on to agenda item five, consideration of the minutes of the 2019 AGM. The AGM, oh, sorry, the agenda has been available on the website for the AIHS for over 21 days and will deal with the, those matters of a traditional AGM nature. These are a number of ordinary business items for this meeting to resolve. We will firstly present the annual report. I will then invite the CEO to give his report. Mr. Nathan Winter, Chair of our Finance, Risk, Audit, Performance and Compliance Board Subcommittee uh, will present the financial report. The appointed returning officer will declare the outcomes of the recent director's elections. And we will then move a motion in relation to the appointment of auditors for 2021 year. So before progressing with the agenda, I will move that the minutes of the previous AGM held on the 5th of September 2019 in Melbourne be accepted as true and accurate reflection of the proceedings of that meeting. So I call for someone on the floor to second that motion. And I'm unaware if someone has seconded that. So, Chris, are you able to? 
Naomi, it's Dave Clark here. Um, we've got a series of people who've raised their hands. Kim Bills, Richard Coleman, Marilyn Hubner, Jonathan Temby, Tim Allred, Brendan Williams, Renee Vandermeer. You can stop now, everyone. I think, I think we've yeah. got a Uber and a uh, second. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. I think I've got Patricia Bill as seconded that motion. Excellent. Um, and so we now ask everyone to raise their hand uh, to vote to accept the minutes. And I'm assuming that we're all good to go. I might just click on my screen here to see. Excellent, we have 30. Yes, we have, we have 30, 30 hands raised, Naomi. And Excellent. So we can let the minutes reflect that the previous AGM minutes have been accepted. Okay, as this is the annual general meeting and no other matters of business were raised by members for resolving, only those matters contained within the agenda will be addressed during this meeting tonight. So I now move to item six, the presentation of the annual report. So it's an honour to present the annual report of the Australian Institute of Health and Safety for 2019-2020 financial year. Last year, our former chair, Mr. Patrick Murphy, opened with this statement. Too many people in Australia are still being killed, seriously injured, or contracting illnesses or disease as a result of work. Unfortunately, that statement is still very true today. For many, 2020 will be a year they'd rather forget for many reasons. As occupational health and safety professionals, what we have experienced and observed is it is important that we don't forget. It is important that we learn from these experiences and most importantly, that we share our knowledge and continue to influence and shape work health and safety now and in the generations to come because every Australian deserves the right to be safe and healthy at work. To date, across Australia, more than 3,500 healthcare workers have tested positive to COVID-19. That is just completely unacceptable. Healthcare workers are considered to work in high-risk environments because they are more likely to have exposure to the disease. And yet we are still having to advocate for better standards, better risk management practices, and better controls for healthcare workers. We are calling for better regulation of workplace health and safety in the healthcare sector. And we are calling out the lack of resourcing dedicated to keeping our healthcare workers and communities safe. Colleagues, our work is not done. I also want to recognise another statement that Patrick made in 2019. His commitment to refocus and strengthen the Institute which in his words involved three phases, to stabilise the organisation, to refresh our strategic direction, and to reposition ourselves for the future. Now I raise this statement to recognise the commitment and leadership of both Patrick Murphy and Mr Nathan Winter over the past six years, and the dedication of our passionate and diligent CEO, Mr David Clark. Without their drive, leadership and persistence, we, the Institute, would not be in the position we are in today. Without the stability and the foundations they set for our new strategic direction, we may not have responded, adapted and transformed in the way we have since March this year. In the annual report, I wrote a quote, if it doesn't challenge you, then it won't change you. And there is no denying over the past six months, we have certainly been challenged and have changed. As a company having, having to adapt to a rapidly changing economy, as a profession having to respond to the uncertainty of a unique hazard and the higher demands it has placed on us all to manage the risk in our workplaces. And the profession, sorry, the personal challenge it has placed on our lives and none more so than on our members and staff in Victoria. 
I open talking about healthcare workers today. I want to close by talking about our workers. As a member-based organisation, we place a lot of focus and attention on our members. Seems reasonable. However, it's critical for the sustainability of the Institute that we also ensure the health, safety and well-being of our invaluable staff. They are a small group of people who do extraordinary things to keep our Institute going. They have all been resilient to the change of working arrangements and life in lockdown. So I want to take a moment to say thank you to them for their commitment, loyalty and effort they bring every day to their work. So thank you, Karen, Penny, Gail, Shona, Rebecca, Tani, Phoebe, Sarah, Jerry, Hassan, Leonie, Maya and David. Our vision is for safe and healthy workers in productive workplaces and communities. So I'm proud to report that the Institute has met its health and safety objectives by ensuring safe and healthy workers in their productive workplaces. So with that, I commend the 2019-2020 annual report to you. And I will now move on to agenda item 6.2 in which is the CEO report. So I would like to invite David Clark uh, to provide his report, focusing on operational matters of the Institute, both in the past year, as well as the coming year. Over to you, Dave. Um, thanks, Naomi. You, you just about made me cry just right then. Um, appreciate it a lot. We really, uh, just on behalf of the staff, really appreciate those words. Um, you know, I was going to have something to say about the staff myself and I'll, and I'll get on with doing that, but I appreciate those words. Um, so I refer everybody to page five of the annual report. Uh, you'll see my chief executive's report. Um, I'm not going to um, diverge too far from it, um, but I wanted to start by saying the past, this past financial year uh, didn't finish the way it started, not for us and not for anybody. Uh, it's been a massive, massive year for pretty much most people on earth. And uh, it's been an extraordinary uh, and challenging time for, for many, many people. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge the, the, the fear uh, and the suffering that many people um, have gone through throughout the world. Uh, we're better off in Australia than in many places, but... Um, you know, in that initial transition period of time, there, there was a tremendous amount of fear um, amongst many, many people, um, myself included. Uh, fear for family and what was going to happen. And uh, I just, uh, the, the abiding thing for me uh, about this past year has been the extraordinary way that the people around me uh, have adapted and uh, coped and, and dealt with what really has been a, an incredibly challenging time. Um, I did want to go through a presentation, maybe without saying the word COVID, um, but uh, I suppose the last few months remind us that um, you don't get everything you wish for. Uh, so that's not going to happen. Um, this is the one time each, each year that I've been at the Institute where I actually um, uh, uh, don't do a forward facing presentation. Uh, it's a reflection. It's the, probably the only time, um, other than in board meetings, when, of course, you would imagine the board, as part of its strategic considerations, um, does it, in, that it, they include reflection. Um, it is a good thing to, once a year, uh, reflect on where you've been, to look around, maybe look down uh, and see that you've climbed a mountain, or look down and see that you actually only see a slot, climbed a small hill, or you might even uh, realise you're in a hole and you're looking looking up out of a hole. Um, but it's important to look back just to just to check out where you actually are and where you sit. Um, and that's what the AGM is to me. Um, so for the past year, uh, when I when I think about the work of the institute, most of it fills me with great pride. Some of it um, makes me wince um, because nothing is perfect. But uh, it's been a very big year, and I think for the most part we've done incredibly well. Um, from February this year, um, we've really been learning about what Agile means, as everybody has, and most of the time, um, 
you know, as the world evolves, we play at the concept of agility um, in, in business. Um, most of the time, uh, it's, it's something that, that you test and think about and talk about and do a little bit here and there. But when a tsunami comes, uh, the story changes and uh, you find out just how agile you are. Um, as I mentioned in the annual report, I think there's been a lot of things changing at the Institute and that sudden shift for us uh, probably wasn't as great as for many other people and organisations who may not have been in, in, a, in a significant change process already. Um, that doesn't mean we still didn't need Herculean efforts to drop everything in March. Uh, we rethought pretty much everything we did. Uh, we cancelled uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of face-to-face uh, -face events and uh, contracts. Uh, we did it all within two weeks. We got everybody home by March the 18th, um, all, all while trying to appear seamless and remain relevant to the crisis that everybody was going through and, and to try to do the best we could for our members and for the health and safety profession. Um, and uh, that's actually what you got from the staff team. Um, you got it from the board. Who, who had a series of crisis meetings. And um, you got it from branch colleagues and network members, many of the people who are here today. You got a process where everybody, the staff team, everybody stopped and said, right, what do we need to do? Um, I will say, I, I would have imagined it might have taken three to six months to do the things we did in those three or so weeks, three to six weeks. Um, and the staff did that with their kids playing on their knees and uh, at the same time, and they did it with sh shaky Wi-Fi connections and uh, nothing planned turning out. Um, so it was an extraordinary effort. And I think when I look back at this past year, that is the thing that I'll remember most, I think, about what, what the last year, and in fact, maybe in some ways, what what my whole time at the Institute has represented. But we do a lot of things very differently now and, uh, and we actually do more of them than ever before. Uh, we do more things today uh, from home than we ever did in March and any year before that in the 70 plus year uh, history of the Institute. Uh, I'm not gonna go through too much more of the detail. It's outlined in the annual report. Um, what I will, I just wanted to say a couple of things about the nature of the profession. Uh, we still have capability gaps. We simply have to collectively raise the standards of our work, of health and safety work. We have to be worthy of what we know to be outstanding, good quality workplace health and safety. And we've got work to do collectively to do that. We're well past the transactional nature of workplace health and safety. The, the work does vary at different levels of the business. But if this profession is going to have a future, it's going to be because the profession produces more people who can bring high level business knowledge and health and safety practice to bear together at the high levels of the business to change the way businesses work. That's actually complex work. There's an old saying about health and safety is maybe simple. Well, done in a very average way, I think health and safety is, might be considered simple. That uh, done to a high standard, I consider it sophisticated work requiring sophisticated thinking. And that's our challenge together, collectively. Um, I wanted to close by uh, thanking the board of the Institute, obviously the staff team, and, and I, I won't name them again because Naomi has, but uh, it's been a privilege uh, working for you this year as a staff team. And I want to thank you for your efforts. Um, it's been fantastic work with Naomi as well. She's put an extraordinary amount of work in, in time and energy in our regular communications ongoingly and more recently in our advocacy work uh, with me. And it, it's been a partnership that I've very much enjoyed and it's been enriching for me in my work. So thank you very much, Naomi. Um, I'll just um, say in closing that uh, what I said at the end of the uh, document, which is uh, it's back to work. Um, for a sustainable future, a sustainable institute and a sustainable profession. Um, we're going to fight for raising standards in education and doing more on that. Um, building capability and professional development is going to become a very strong part of our work. And our voice will grow. And when you do, when you grow your voice, you do it with courage because you don't 
always have agreement about the things that you say. You don't necessarily even always get it right, but you have to be courageous in your advocacy. We're going to do more in policy and advocacy and build the voice of the profession so we have more of a say about things like COVID-19 and healthcare standards in hospitals and many, many other things. So every year at the Institute is a bigger one than ever before. And uh, I look forward to the next year and joining everybody. And finally, special thanks to every volunteer at the Institute that makes the Institute what it, what it is each and every year and each and everything that we do. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm back. Stay with me, Dave. I, oh, no, stay, come back, Dave. Because now it's time for questions. Uh, so I didn't ask for questions after um, I spoke. And at the moment, Dave, you don't have, David, turn your camera back on, please. Um, I can't, Naomi. Um, oh, Penny, can you please turn my, it My good friend, Penny, my good colleague, Penny, has turned it off on me. So we, me. <laughs> we, we don't have any questions coming through, but I just wanted to explain also extend upon that thank you to all of our volunteers. I did not include that in my speech, so thank you for covering that, Dave. Um, uh, we do have a question that's popped up now. Um, I just wanted to extend upon that around the voice and the courage piece. Um, I noticed recently on LinkedIn, there was a, a bit of talk around influence and, and having greater influence. And so what's your take on, you know, courageously advocating for healthcare workers and, and um, standards in Australia? And how does that um, help us build influence, Dave? Well, I'm not sure which builds which. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like trying to um, jump on a wheel that's already rolling down a hill. <laughs> uh, you, you, look, um, I think to be effective in advocacy, there are organisations I've said before that spend millions of dollars a year on advocacy and are not effective. Um, there's a particular kind of advocacy that we stand for at the Institute that we want to do. We want to be evidence-based in our advocacy. We want to focus on the things that we know we have a right to talk about and leave the other things to other people. Uh, take COVID-19, we talk about healthcare workers and hospitals, for example, 40% of the 3,150 worker infections are, are of nurses and hospitals are not responding um, to uh, proper workplace health and safety practice. Somebody has to speak. The regulators are quiet. So sometimes these things call you forward uh, to speak. We, we do not speak up just to hear the sound of our own voice. Uh, we, we speak on things we know we have to when you do speak into a status quo where there is an axis of power and influence, um, people want you to shut up. Uh, they don't want to hear you, and you and I have experienced that in recent weeks in some of the responses that we've been getting. Um, but uh, that's just part of doing what you do. If you stay evidence-based, if you keep your conviction, if you act with integrity in the advocacy that you undertake, um, I'm not sure if it's a matter of... Um, evidence or faith, and I'm not a faith, I'm not a person of faith, but uh, I've often called advocacy a faith-based activity because there's not always evidence you're succeeding, but eventually you start to make an influence and grow. As long as you stick to those rules, that's my experience. Thank you. Um, so we haven't had any questions, uh, so I will move on. Uh, so section, uh, sorry, agenda item 6.3 is the financial report. So I now invite Chair of our Finance, Risk, Audit, Performance and Compliance Committee, or the FRAC as we <laughs> call it, Nathan Winter, to present the financial report of the Australian Institute of Health and Safety and to talk about the current and predicted financial performance of the AIHS for the coming year. Hi everyone, and thank you, Naomi. Uh, there's a link to our FY20 financial statements in the email that was sent out to all AIHS members yesterday with the subject live stream AIHS general meeting 2020. It was towards the bottom of that email under the heading in the meantime. Alternatively, you can find our FY20 financial statements by going to the AIHS website, which is www.aihs.org.au and then clicking on the resources tab near the top. And then on the next screen that comes up, scroll down and click on the orange button annual reports and strategic plan, and then AIHS financial statements 2019 
slash 2020 with the first document you see. So for FY20, the board approved a break even budget, and then COVID happened. So between March and June, more than 30 scheduled face to face events, which generate important revenue for the Institute had to be cancelled. Fortunately, the National Office staff demonstrated great agility and through their very quick and tireless work and combined with some understanding suppliers, we were able to cancel venue bookings and limit associated expenses such as catering and successfully managed to recoup deposits for the vast majority of the face-to-face -face events that have been planned. The national lockdown that prohibited these face-to-face -face events and shut down larger parts of the Australian economy gave us great concern that in addition to loss of revenue for events, we may have higher rates of non-renewals from our individual and corporate members and less revenue from other events, which were switched to a virtual format, including national conference. However, some of our revenue streams from March to June remain very strong. Unlike in a general economic downturn where all of the businesses support functions, including workplace health and safety experience funding cuts during a pandemic funding cuts to work health and safety weren't so much of an issue, provided you work for a business that was still able to operate. While we're aware that some of our members that work for theatrical companies or airlines were stood down or had their budget squeezed as a result of COVID, fortunately the vast majority of our members work in high hazard industries and for essential services, which have continued to operate throughout the pandemic. This has meant we have not seen as large a drop in members, numbers, individuals or corporates as we we're expecting and we've even had new corporate members come on board during the pandemic. Hence, even with COVID-19 and through the aid of the government's small business stimulus package and job care payments, our revenue for FY20 was actually up 5.9% to $1,834,862. This led to a surplus of $102,126 so again, this year I've asked that this number not be rounded off because the only reason this surplus is as large as it is is because of the National Office's staff's diligent efforts to very quickly chase every dollar and cancel those bookings for venues and associated catering costs before we were bound to incur additional costs and even allowing us to recruit deposits that and the um, government stimulus packages, of course. So this is more than restored the cash reserves we invested in FY19 to improve our database and web-based systems and provides a basis for our FY21 budget spending. So this year we've again been provided with an unqualified audit opinion by our auditors, More Australia, that our financial statements are a true and accurate reflection of the Institute's financial position. Uh, as always, I'll share the three minor findings that the auditors did raise during this year's audit. One was around leave balances and ensuring that they didn't become excessive. Given the largest leave balance for any of our staff was just over six weeks, and that will be used when that staff member goes on maternity leave shortly. And given the current COVID restrictions and given our current strong balance sheet, we don't believe our current level is a lever of concern. Uh, the second finding was around how we account for joining fees. So we recognise joining fees as revenue in the month that they received. Technically, according to the accounting standard, a joining fees meant to be spread over the expected life of the membership. This would mean that we'd have to go through the process each month of journaling about 27 cents of the $30 joining fee for every member based on the average length of membership of the Institute, which is currently about eight years. This would cost us more to process over the eight years than the $30 joining fee received in the first place. Hence, we don't follow this process. The third was regarding a missing receipt from a small value transaction on the company credit card where a statutory declaration had been submitted instead given that the original receipt had been lost. So this isn't a crime occurrence, but a process that we follow in the event of a lost receipt. So none of these three findings prevented us from receiving an unqualified audit opinion that our financial statements are a true and accurate reflection of the Institute's financial position. For FY21, the board has approved a deficit budget of $102,000 to reinvest our members' funds in developing the Institute's online training capability and to ensure that there are plenty of opportunities for our certified members to be able to complete the required continuing professional development. This is the largest deficit that the board has approved during my time as chair of the Finance Risk Audit Performance and Compliance Committee. However, it's supported by our FY20 surplus and backed by a plan for that investment that I believe has the greatest opportunity to deliver a very long-term return for our 
members and improve our overall ability to achieve our vision of safe and healthy people in productive workplaces and communities. So in summary, the Institute has had another good financial year for FY20, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, like Naomi and David, I'd also like to extend my thanks to um, all the staff at the Institute for their ongoing work, as well as the other members of the Finance Risk Audit Performance and Compliance Committee. Thank you. Um, what questions do you have about our FY20 financial statements? Thank you, Nathan. Oh, they're coming in now. Okay, so Marilyn Hubner has asked, uh, will the surplus only focus on online training or, with fingers crossed, a return to face-to-face -face events? David, would you like to come in and perhaps help answer the question? So the, the surplus is um, generated, so, so we're, we're forecasting it or budgeted for a deficit, but um, there are certainly some face-to-face -face events that are planned, um, obviously not in Victoria in the near future, but there are at this stage, and again, subject to um, the, the, how, how the COVID pandemic evolves. Um, but there are there are face-to-face -face events planned later on this year in South Australia and Western Australia. Um, but again, um, they they subject to change. Yeah, I I might add to that, Naomi. Just in particular, answer the question. We all we all know that the face-to-face -face experience, what it is, and um, you know what it contains, that the online experience doesn't. Um, you know, it's it's in it's we're unable to tell the future with COVID nineteen and how this is going to play out. So everything we have planned has plan Bs. Every, uh, whenever we can run face-to-face -face events safely and properly and not be the Australian Institute of Health and Safety creating a COVID um, transmission <laughs> or the cause of an outbreak, uh, we, we will run those face-to-face -face events. And we know our members want to get back to those. Uh, all of our framework of operations and our finances are geared towards doing that and towards doing it online if we need to. So Nathan, we have a second question, but I think it's actually directed towards David. So David, please stay on the screen for us. Um, the next question is from Ray Moos. How is the online training to be developed and who can be involved? So I, I'd say that's a David answer. Yeah, that's right. So um, there's there's a few things we're doing. So we've built a we've built a professional, we're building a professional development framework, if you like. As an organisation, we're moving much more. People will be aware we've gone to CPD points. Martin Campbell's taken on the chairmanship of the College of Fellows uh, CPD committee. We're looking at professional development in the wider context. Deb Burlington, who's on today, is now chairing up the mentoring committee and we're revamping our mentoring program. These things are all coming together with a range of different learning options. We're introducing a learning management system um, which will allow for automated online learning and first cab off the rank, and this will be launched at the end of November, will be an ethics program. Giving voice to values, those of you at the conference in May would have heard from um, Mary Gentile. We have engaged with Darden University um, in the USA and we're building a Workplace Health and Safety Australian Giving Voice to Values program. And we're also building a couple of modules of online learning from the new OHS Body of Knowledge chapter on ethics. There will be other courses and programs to come based around the data we've been gathering for some time about um, setting priorities of certain things that work best for online learning. Um, there's an overall framework where we're pushing out much more with our endorsements and engaging more in partnerships with the better training providers out there to provide a wider suite of activities for everybody to undertake. If that's something you'd like to get personally involved in, which was the second part of your question, um, you're most welcome to reach out to me uh, on my email, ceo at aihs.org.au. Let me know about you, about what your interest is, about what you bring to the table yourself, um, and how you'd like to maybe participate or, or ask me the question, how can I? Uh, tell me that little bit about you and, and we'll see whether or not we can find ways to include you. Thanks, David. Um, so, Nathan, it looks like you're off the hook. No tough financial questions come through. <laughs> so, thank you. And um, I will move on. Um, 
I will move on by asking, uh, proposing that the annual report as presented by Nathan is uh, accepted by the membership. So I'll call for a seconder. See someone come through. John, John Temby. Excellent, thank you, John. And uh, we'll get everyone to raise their hands. And Bruce Nichols. Let's get everyone to raise their hands to accept. Yeah, you got 37, 39. Got fabulous. So we can let the minutes reflect that the annual report as presented um, has been accepted. Thank you, David. And I'll move on to agenda item seven, which is the declaration of, di of the director's election. Uh, so I now invite Chris back, our company secretary, to announce the result of the 2020 director's election. Thanks, Naomi, and hi, everyone, again. Um, so I just want to confirm that uh, this year uh, we've had an electronic uh, vote, and it's obviously a direct vote. And all the votes closed on uh, the 1st of September, and they were tabulated um, after the closing date. Uh, we had 335 members participate. There's a total of 868 uh, valid votes that were casted, so formal votes and one informal vote. And I can just go through the results very quickly. Um, we had uh, 59 votes for Bilal Syed, uh, 263 votes for Naomi Kemp, uh, 148 votes for Aaron Nelson, uh, 197 votes for Liam O'Connor, and 201 votes for Celia Antonovsky. Um, so therefore, I declare that Naomi Kemp, Celia Antonovsky, and Liam O'Connor were elected as directors to the Safety Institute of Australia otherwise known as the AIHS, uh, for a period of three years. So congratulations to um, all those members. And I'd like to hand over to the Deputy Chair, Cameron Montgomery. Thank you for that, um, uh, Chris. Um, now moving on to uh, agenda item eight, the appointment of uh, the auditor. I'll also now invite uh, Nathan Winter to present a motion for the appointment of the auditors for the AIHS for the 2020-21 financial year. Nathan. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, I'd like to move that we retain more Australia as our auditor for 2020-21 financial year. Michelle Price has done that. Second yeah. Thanks, David. Kim Bills. And then we need everyone to raise their hands to accept. I got, here we go. 34, 37, 38. So again, that motion's passed as well. That's passed. Thanks, Cam. Thanks, Nathan. And moving on to agenda item nine, other business and moving towards the closure of the meeting. Um, firstly, I'd like to also extend uh, my congratulations to um, incoming directors in Naomi um, for her second term, Celia and Liam for their first term. So congratulations to you all. I'd also like to announce that as there are no special motions to be put and there was no provision for the general business to be raised from the floor outside of the scope of the agenda, that the meeting is now closed. Um, and, and just prior to closing that, I'd like to also um, thank our outgoing uh, directors and uh, Bryce McLaren, um, who is still uh, contributing towards our Queensland branch, Hannah Waters, who is still in, uh, in the US, and Martin Campbell, who served as an alternate um, for Hannah uh, since November 2019 and has done an amazing job as well. So thank you to you all. I'll now um, acknowledge with uh, closing of the AGM, uh, we do um, are going to hand over to um, David Clark, our CEO, who will introduce uh, the life membership uh, presentation and awardees. Thank you. 
Thanks, Cameron. Um, can I just, uh, uh, just by way of acknowledging our new board members, I just want everybody to know that uh, what you can see there is the beginning of a West Australian takeover of the Institute with uh, Liam and, uh, and Celia on board. So um, the other states are gonna need to um, get themselves together and put some you know, more candidates forward or who knows what'll happen if the West Australians get control. So you know, you've gotta watch out for that kind of stuff. Um, it's a great ple with great pleasure that I I now go to um, to opening the this next session that Naomi is going to run with our live members. Um, the uh, life membership award is is very much about a person um, who has made a long term and life uh, across across a very long career contribution uh, to the institute. Um, we don't hand out a lot of life memberships. Um, the carriage of a life membership is one where the person retains their membership free of charge for the period of their, their life if they wish it. Um, they have all voting rights, they have all rights, rights of other members, they attend everything uh, in, at uh, member rates and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and they no longer pay membership fees. It's, a, it's an acknowledgement of an outstanding contribution to the work of the Institute. And uh, this year we have some fantastic new life members. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly about each of them and then I'm going to hand you over to Naomi, who's going to um, just run a short session and you're going to be here from them. So when you hear from Mike Capra, you want to know that um, Mike's been advocating uh, for uh, OHS professional education and inclusive research in OHS education for decades. He was the inaugural first chair of the Australian OHS Education Accreditation Board, which has been a, a tremendous success um, and in no small part uh, due to Mike's great leadership. He's been a fantastic person to work with. Um, he's overseen the whole development of the program, worked very closely initially with Pam Pryor as the, um, as the early um, registrar and with, with uh, a range of really outstanding board members. Um, he's chaired a number of accreditation assessments and been an ambassador for OCAB's work. Uh, he, he also did, uh, made significant contributions to the early work on the Australian OHS body of knowledge. And his whole career has been a significant contribution to the field of health and safety, especially in education and research. Um, this was recognised by him being awarded with the Harold Greenwood Thomas Award and life membership. So Mike comes as a winner of the Harold Greenwood Thomas Award, um, which uh, is for an even wider contribution than just life membership. Um, Andrew Hopkins is here with us today as well. Um, another person who virtually needs no introduction. Uh, he uh, he uh, has also been the winner of the uh, Harold Greenwood Th uh, Thomas Lifetime Achievement Award, um, it, which carries life membership. Um, he uh, He's teaching and has a high degree supervision role at ANU. He's published 16 books. 27 chapters, 71 peer-reviewed articles, and many others with book sales exceeding 100,000. He's lectured, consulted to audiences and companies around the world, and made substantial contributions to the Institute's publications and events over many years. Um, fantastic contribution to safety to prevent major accidents in high-risk industries. So um, welcome, Andrew. And I'm not sure if Penny's putting these people on board as I say their names, but I hope so. Um, Pam, Prior. Well, Pam, uh, everybody knows Pam. Pam um, is a new life member of the Institute. The, she is a previous winner of the Harold Greenwood Thomas Award. And uh, the, the board made a decision to bestow life membership on all members of the Harold Greenwood Thomas Award. And, you know, um, Pam probably would have won that um, life membership earlier. It's just she's continued to make extraordinary contributions to the work of the Institute. She is the single person who's taught me more about workplace health and safety and about structures, systems and processes around this field um, of anybody else. She's still a mentor to me. Uh, her contribution to the whole field of health and safety, but the Institute's work on the body of knowledge, the accredit education accreditation, the global capability framework that she co-authored, the certification program, those, those contributions can't be overstated. And uh, we welcome Pam as a life member of the Institute. David Segret. 
uh, long-serving member of the ACT branch committee who put in tremendous work over very, very many years, as well as his work as the secretary, the company secretary of the Institute. Um, come back, he's been incredibly reliable and steadfast supporter of the work of the Institute. Um, a great person to have around with in, in the grassroots work that makes a, makes a branch function as well over very, very many years, as well as that absolute contribution at the, uh, at the high level of the board as well. And of course, a career in health and safety um, of significance. And um, uh, he's, he's uh, been involved in mentoring and supporting new committee members really regularly. He's a great person to give advice and I've certainly listened to plenty of his advice in recent years. So we welcome David to life membership of the Institute. And finally, Karen Wolf. Um, Karen has been a branch president in New South Wales and, and on the Institute's board on two occasions. Um, she was the inaugural chair of the IHS College of Fellows Mentorship Program Committee, which Deb um, Burlington now, now has. Um, she's made significant progress in supporting the initial establishment and implementation of the program. Um, Karen's made a great contribution to the work of the Institute over very many years. She's got energy ideas and integrity. She's got a lot of respect and she's valued by the people who she works with. And it's great to have her on board and I know Karen's here today as well. And so we welcome Karen and I want to personally congratulate all of you for the work you've done and, uh, and welcome you now to the session run by Naomi as we hear a little bit from you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Have I, I've got limited view of who's on screen. Have our life members um, turned their videos on? I will see if I can. Yes, they have. Excellent. Righty -o. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm not in control because I don't have the controls to the Zoom. Okay, uh, so we are meant to finish at six, but we have five really amazing people to interview. So we may go a little bit over. So I, I invite people to stay online and um, stay with us to hear from uh, these amazing people. Uh, so I have my first question is both to Pam, Karen and David. Uh, so we might go in that order if that works. Uh, so the first question is, legacy is one of our values at the Institute. So what is the legacy that you would like to be remembered for, for your contribution to the Institute? Uh, you, you've given me the hard task of going first. Uh, I, it's an interesting question when you say my legacy, because I don't see it as a legacy for me. Um, I see it as it's been a privilege. Uh, and I'm the one who's, who's had the benefit. Uh, anything that I've done, um, I guess, right back, and it's too many years, but has really been focused on developing the profession. And that's the thing that has, has engaged me, um, has made me, and I have to say it, have a ball. It's, it's really been great fun as well as very satisfying. But anything that I've been involved in, and um, Dave's listed the, probably the three key things that I would think about, but none of those were possible without the involvement of other people and the support of other people. And Dave mentioned Mike Capra's involvement with the body of knowledge. Uh, Mike and I were the Safety Institute people on the technical panel for the body of knowledge. Mike has supported the development of the body of knowledge ongoing. It was only last week I sent him a please help phone call. Uh, Mike, this isn't happening. Can you please step in and you know, stir something up and make it happen? Uh, Leo Rashina is, was another person on the technical panel who had my back all the way through the body of knowledge, as well as the academics and the professionals who contributed. We couldn't have done it without them. Uh, Dave mentioned the accreditation board, and that's been one of the, the really great things that um, I think we've done in the profession. Uh, again, it was a whole lot of people involved in that, and I had the privilege and the pleasure of working with those people to see it happen. Um, without people like uh, Bruce King, who was our education advisor, again, Mike, and the people on the board, as well as the educators who engaged with us. Um, if, we, if they hadn't been prepared to be involved, we would have gone nowhere. And I guess the global capability framework, and then for me, the option of working with that INCHPO board, um, with people like Professor Andrew Hale from the UK, and uh, Dennis Hudson from the US, that was an opportunity that five or 10 years ago, I would never ever have expected to have. So 
I'm not sure that legacy is the right word, but I feel very excited for the profession. And one of the things that I would like to think is that um, those of the younger people, um, that they get, have an awareness of where we've come from and that they respect where we've come from. And I think there is a little danger that it's sort of all about us now and where we're going. And I think it is an exciting time for the profession, but we need to respect where we've come from for the last 50, 60, 70 years uh, and build on that to go forward. But it's a great time and I've been very privileged to be involved with it up until now. So thanks to the AIHS for the, the life membership. That's not why any of us who are here tonight do things, but it is really nice to, to have that recognition as well. So thank you, Naomi, on behalf of the, the Institute for me. No worries. Thank you, Pam. I'm pretty certain your name <laughs> will be forever in French across many things. <laughs> you won't be forgotten. <laughs> Karen. Now that was out of turn, Naomi. I was having a little zizz thinking of my words. <laughs> Look, this is uh, like like Pam. I, I find this uh, very humbling because my involvement with the institute wasn't really about me. It was uh, I've been very very lucky to walk amongst professional giants, and they've actually helped me mature and grow professionally. And I think I don't I don't look for a legacy. I think anything I've done has never my peers and, and the profession and with a great view my all of us had I think about what we could do and the difference that we could make for Australia and for the people of Australia and it's just been a privilege to be involved and work across all the states and just know so many amazing people and be involved and I, I think of my time particularly on the board is a bit like the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie you know there's always three and the one in the middle is a bit dodgy and I, I think the the time that I had in the board was that kind of dodgy time it's the it's the time you've got to have to move on to the really great stuff um, because you know the people that set the, the, the SIA up set it up with the passion for where it could go um, and then I came on board at a time, you know, with people like John Temby and David Segrot and Tony Mitchell, because I saw he was online, um, when, when we were actually trying to break from being a state-based organisation to being a truly Australian-based organisation. And, you know, there's always scraped knees and broken teeth and a, a couple of fights behind the toilet block when that goes on. And, and I, you know, I just like to think that the, that the work I did with all those wonderful people has actually established the the AIHS and the fantastic work that the board and, uh, and you, Naomi, and everybody is taking forward and, and the work that Dave's done and, and the, the team down there, it's just fantastic. So do I have a legacy? I, I just look at all the work that's happening and I look at the beautiful people that are on, online and I think, well, there's, there's a legacy to be proud of. Thank you so much for this honour. <laughs> no worries. And David? Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you to the Institute for the honour of um, life membership. Um, I suppose in terms of what I would consider um, the legacy that I've left behind within the safety space, it's um, primarily been seeing the transition of the organisation from, as Karen said, a state-based, fairly disparate and quite often disjointed and somewhat dysfunctional process to being a very professional organisation run by professionals in a professional manner. Um, and that is very much reflective of the calibre of the people that are now putting their hand up to serve on the board. We've now got people who are not only safety professionals, but are business professionals that come to the organisation um, not for what they can get out of the organisation, but for what they can give to the organisation. And um, if I've had a small part in, um, you know, sort of pushing the wheel along to get the organisation to the structure that we currently have, um, to encourage people to come onto the board, um, as Dave said, I've done some mentoring and I've you know, sort of held the hands of a few of the 
new directors a long way. And um, that's been an absolute privilege um, to be part of that process. And uh, as I'm you know, sort of heading towards the uh, more twilight years of my career, I, I, I will still look longingly at what I've been able to achieve um, in terms of being part of the journey to uh, the professionalising the profession. And um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be part of that. And thank you, Naomi, and I think you're doing a great job. And I'm looking forward to um, watching the new board continue the work that's uh, been done over the recent years. Thank you, David. And uh, yes, uh, when I came onto the board, you were you were the you were the walking constitution. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Andrew and Mike. <laughs> um, now you guys have been uh, bestowed life membership as part of being recognised with the Harold Greenwood Thomas Award, which is the the highest um, award that the institute has for contributions to the profession. So with everything that you guys have done. What is it? What would be the one thing you'd like to be remembered for? Um, I'll, I'll start with Andrew. <laughs> uh, you're on mute, Andrew. Sorry. <laughs> okay, now you can hear me. Um, there are so many. I'm not sure how to answer that question. It's a, it's a tricky one. It's an embarrassing one in some respects. But look, the first thing I want to say is I, I really appreciate this award of life membership, and I really appreciate the. Uh, getting the Harold Greenwood Thomas um, Lifetime Achievement Recognition Award. It's, um, it's true, I've been beavering away for a lifetime, it seems like. And, um, and to have that recognised is, um, I, I really appreciate that. I think in terms of what have I achieved, what would I like to be remembered for? Um, I, think it's, I think it's the books, some of the books I've written, um, which are um, widely read and I reflect on why they're widely read and part of the reason is that um, they are based upon the suffering of a, num a large number of people, the death of a significant number of people and I think it's, um, I think I couldn't have written those books had they not been about tragedy and I think I want those tragedies to be remembered and I'm sure they are remembered and that's really um, uh, I think why the books have an appeal because they are in a sense um, a commemoration of that tragedy and a, those tragedies and an attempt to learn lessons from those tragedies. Of course the very sad thing is that every single one of those tragedies the lessons are pretty much the same and we are not learning. Um, and I guess that leads me to second thing I'd like to think I've contributed and this this is to tie into something that David Clark mentioned that we need that the um, industry of oh, sorry this uh, institute and, and safety professionals need to um, focus on the higher levels of, of large organizations um, that's where we can have we need to have impact and that's where I have been trying to focus and I think what I have particularly brought to the debate is a focus on two things, organizational structure, the, the ways in which um, organizations are structured, big organizations are structured, and how those structures contribute to the accidents that ha have happened or uh, conversely can prevent them from happening. And the other thing is on um, production bonuses and, and monetary bonuses. These things have traditionally been outside the scope of health and safety professionals, they need to be brought within the scope and they are being brought within the scope. And I'm very glad that they are. Um, I think the other thing I want to say is again, reflecting on some words that have been used earlier in the, in the, um, in the evening, courage. Um, and I think what it takes to be a health and safety professional is courage. Um, because you are whistleblowers. That's another word. We hasn't hasn't been used today, but I think it's an important word. You find yourself um, confronting the power, the powers that be in the organisations you work for, from a relatively lowly position, and it takes courage to pursue what you know to be the right thing in that in that context. You need to be a whistleblower. You need to have the courage of whistleblowers. And I take my hat off to the. Um, 
health and safety professionals who are able to do that. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. And Mike, uh, you're on mute as well, so make sure you unmute first. No, you're still on mute, Mike. I, I can't unmute you. You need to go down the bottom of your screen and unless Penny can do that. If you hover your map, your there we go, you're on. <laughs> I am deaf, I pay no attention. <laughs> so I'd like to sort of begin as the other folks have basically, and you know, really, it's not about an individual get these awards. I mean, it's a great privilege and a great honor, but uh, really it's a lot of people who have worked together to get where we are now. And I guess if I would like to be remembered by anything, it would be, the shift in tertiary education that um, we came to. When I first started in this business, I was uh, teaching toxicology and physiology and somebody said to me, you're gonna teach HHS. I thought, my God, what's that? Mm -hmm. And so I got into it and then got really uh, captivated by the whole thing. And as Andrew says, you know, the, the people have died, et cetera, uh, with accidents and ill health has been a great motivating factor. So I would like to be remembered just by being part of a team. And I'd like to acknowledge Pam here as being one of the real driving forces in this, the driving force. And has been, it was a great pleasure to work with her initially on the body of knowledge. And we did do a couple of grants together before, well, during that process. And I think by bringing all the uh, tertiary providers together, I think that was very successful. and. Uh, by the time I left the accreditation board, I think we had about 90% of the programs or courses in Australia accredited. And I think it's probably near 100, it's probably 100% now. And I think that is one thing that has really driven the development of the profession. Obviously that came out of the body of knowledge and I had a, a very minor role in that just on, on the committee as an SIA person. But again, that was a uh, was a, a game changer in terms of OHS in this country, and not just this country, but but the world as well. And then moving into the accreditation board and seeing so many universities come together, and really coming to share uh, our curriculum and looking at what we needed to do in that curriculum. I, I think it also uh, established collegiality with many of the groups in Australia providing OHS education. So. I think that's that's it for me. You know, it, it's basically I'd like to be remembered about that. I just had just looked up legacy and it said something about after your death, but I think maybe we can do that before <laughs> that happens. <laughs> so I would like no to predictions. <laughs> be remembered that I was part of many people who put that together. And I'd also like to well I said thank Pam, but also that the institution formerly known as the SIA, um, they were very, very supportive. We had a couple of bit, bit of couple of bumps along the way, but when Dave Clark came along, things changed drastically. We got a lot of support from David, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. And then all the people from the universities who contributed as well brought this whole thing together. So, yes, I'm privileged uh, and I'm honoured, but there's a, there were an awful lot of people who brought us to where we are now. Thank you. I uh, listening to everyone's response the humble was the word that came to mind and just watching the chat function roll as you were all speaking um, I think that was a very common word used um, in your in your responses to that I have one more question I do know we're out of time but I am going to ask this of Pam and Karen collectively both ladies you have doubled the female life membership of the institute <laughs> our other two life members uh, Cheryl Dell and Margaret Cook. Um, so you now join a very small but uh, very unique group. Um, so what uh, advice or uh, uh, tip would you give to um, emerging females in the health and safety industry? Emerging female leaders. Uh, right? Yeah, I I'm not sure that I've got any tips, but I was just reflecting over a glass of wine a couple of nights ago that uh, when I went to then uh, Ballarat College of Advanced Education and did my grad dip, um, I was one of four women uh, out of 40. Uh, two of those women didn't make it back after the first semester. And the other woman was Michelle Patterson, who later became CEO of um, 
I think it was SafeWorks South Australia. So um, things that, and I also remember going to an IOSH conference in middle eighties, early nineties. And all I could see was all these white V's when I stood up to make a presentation. Those white V's were men's shirt, white shirts and there was hardly any women in the room. I think it's fabulous now that those numbers have almost turned around. Um, I don't know that I have any, have any advice for, for women except to be yourself and don't try and be someone else. Um, I think when you, when you try to be someone else, you, you just don't succeed. So um, that's, it's not a pearl of wisdom, but um, I, think it's, I think it's great to see where we've come from and that it is not unusual now to see women, female OHS people, even in some of the heavy industry areas. Thank you. And Karen, I see you there, a granddaughter. I have a granddaughter. This is the future. The future of safety is on my lap here. Um, look, <laughs> it, is, it, is, uh, it is not an easy role that we take on. Andrew said it very, very uh, succinctly that, you know, we are frequently whistleblowers. You cannot be timid to be in our job, but you do have to be passionate and you do have to be committed. And I just think it's the most amazing and rewarding job in the world. And I would encourage any woman to do it. And if, if I've got any advice, advice, I would say buy a red dress. Because like Pam, I can remember walking into a conference and, and coming down escalators and just seeing a sea of black. And I thought, oh my God. And I'd actually want a black suit too. And I thought, this is the last time I'm going to buy a red dress and I'm going to stand out every time I go to one of these jolly things. So um, buy a red dress, take the job on. It is the most rewarding and valuable job, but you, you have to believe in yourself because you're often sticking your chin out. So, but it's a great job. Yeah. And welcome back, Dave. <laughs> um, you popped in before, Dave. Did you have a question or were you coming in to wrap us up? Um, well, no, I was, just, I was just coming in because, you know, I just got sick of not being in the party and it was pretty cool. <laughs> um, no, no, I'm, um, I was just coming toward the end, Naomi, and uh, I was just coming in to join and um, just again want give, to give my words of thanks to the, uh, to the, to the panellists. Um, you know, you're all in certain ways still involved very significantly in work, the ongoing work of health and safety and, and, and in the work of the Institute. And it's, it's just great to have people like you um, who I get to, you know, be part of serving um, as part of the profession. Because uh, that's what the staff team do. We serve the profession. We serve you. Um, and uh, and again, Naomi, thank you for that for the leadership of the last year. It's been a it's been a big and a tough year, and next year's probably going to be bigger and tougher. But I think we're all up for it. Um, Cameron Montgomery called you all a bunch of trailblazers. <laughs> so I think on that note, <laughs> we can end the and end the panel discussion. And I'll hand over to you, Dave, or are we? I actually, off the top of my head, I don't think I had the closing responsibilities, but no. um, we've got the last, Naomi, as, as the chair of the Institute, you had the last word. I have the last word. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, enjoy your dinner tonight. And hopefully we will all see everyone soon face to face. Um, and uh, I believe Safety Fest is still happening, so get on in there if you haven't haven't already um nathan you've joined us again did you want to pop it no awesome well i think that's it i, I think we can sign off okay say good night thanks bye. very much thanks. bye bye everybody bye. Bye, all. okay good night not all